Thank you very much, Serena, and colleagues from across Europe. Uh, I remember when Mark and I began discussing this project some years ago, um, some of you may have noticed we had uh, some strange voting in the UK, uh, but uh, Mark and I were determined, and through his good offices, we got ministers to back joining this, because to be absolutely candid, is whatever else happens politically, scientifically, and in healthcare, we are far better together. So uh, I'm going to shepherd you through how we began to make a difference with the infrastructure for the 100,000 Genomes Project. I will touch a little bit about how Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales were involved, but I'm not going to say very much because my colleagues from those nations will speak about their participation and future plans. So uh, these are my disclosures. I, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, and this is the anatomy of the 100,000 Genomes Project. Mark showed you earlier the strategy of Genome UK. Essentially, the 100,000 Genomes Project and the subsequent Genomic Medicine Service, which you will hear later about this morning, um, we, the, this is the paving of the way for that. This is the establishment infrastructure for that transformative inception in the health system. And Genomics England therefore occupies a direct healthcare partnership space with NHS England. And we were asked to sequence 100,000 whole genomes from patients with rare disease, cancer and infection, and over 97,000 people have been reached by the program. That's 40 plus petabytes of data, which is in a secure data center uh, in Wiltshire, but will shortly move to the cloud so that we can be more interoperable and federate our data sets with colleagues here across Europe uh, for the greater good of patients wherever they are in the world, but particularly in our partners in Europe. We established an infrastructure, and I'll show you that. Some of that infrastructure has moved on to new form, but uh, you'll see that when Alex Picard speaks about the NHS later. But I'm going to show you what I think is needed in it, wherever you are to connect this into the health system. Uh, you know your health systems best and can structure it best for the community that you will face. But the agenda of this project is to make really a step change in how we do this across Europe. And, and how we bring benefit to patients. And so it's really important to engage the health system and empower the health system to do this. So at the peak of the program, uh, we reached across 98 different hospital organizations in England. That's about half of the hospitals in England. And um, we had regional equity of access and coverage um, and about 5,000 frontline staff worked on the program. Uh, we knew that the data we would get would not necessarily always be immediately usable, but what we did was to try and ensure that we had a coalition of research intellects. So we openly advertised in Nature and other places, and over 3,000 people from 33 countries, as Mark showed you, have volunteered to drive up the value of this data for clinical care. This is the infrastructure that we established. And you'll notice that I refer here to the Scottish Genomes Partnership, and you'll hear a bit about that from my good colleague Zosia, and also the engagement in Northern Ireland as an additional genomic medicine centre from uh, Shane McKee and in Wales from Clive Morgan. So I'm not going to talk more about that, but except to say, if you were to do this with equity and to make sure it transforms healthcare, it's really important that we move beyond regional endeavour to national endeavour which is the B1MG um, goal. And that means that there's no section of our community, wherever we are in Europe, uh, that is left out of the program. And one of the things I was very determined about when I started, because this was an England only project, is that Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, no part of the UK unreached. And I think uh, you'll hear from other colleagues whether we succeeded or not. The model that we have on the left-hand side, so I think the right-hand side is just a map of the infrastructure we set up at that time. However one does this in any country, you need uh, a set of infrastructure. We established genomic medicine centers because what that did was to make national recognition of the excellence we had in the health system and our researchers and bring that necessary coalition to develop the resource together. And um, the fundamental basis of the program is based on informed consent uh, and the clinicians in the front line accrued the samples with the healthcare professionals and the clinical data, and we collect longitudinal data from every electronic health source we can get. And I'll show you the data that we have in a moment. 
um, and give you some examples of how it's made a difference. We have a centralized biorepository at the UK Biocenter and a centralized sequencing center, which we built with Wellcome Trust Funds, and that's in the Sanger. The Sanger built it for us, and it's one floor of the Ogilvy building, and that is leased to Illumina. And we have a strong partnership with Illumina. We also work with others in the sequencing field now, but Illumina has brought live an ISO accredited sequencing pipeline. And now Genomics England has bought an ISO accredited end to end analysis pipeline, which I'll show you in a moment. So the Genomics England informatics architecture is at the moment this 40 plus petabyte data center, but we are moving to the Amazon Web Service Cloud. And then we have a coalition of international researchers, which we call the Genomics England Clinical Interpretation Partnership, and a discovery forum of some industry users. Increasingly, instead of focusing on lots of companies, we are increasingly focusing on a, a larger engagement with a few larger companies. And at the end of the day, the key linkage is to return the results of the program, the analyses of the 100,000 genome to the clinicians who own the relationship with the patient, convey the results and actually validate the findings. So actually the clinicians are empowered to decide what goes back to the front line. And that's been really important. And that has created the activation energy for a new genomic medicine service because the frontline healthcare workers were involved in the program. And so within six years, we've been able to achieve transformation that all too often in British medicine takes between nine and 16 years, if you look at reports on how quickly we translate things into healthcare. So this is our ISO accredited pipeline. I've simplified it. Um, we're non-proprietal about all of our ISO accredited uh, data sets, um, uh, information. We will give you all the documents that we've developed. We're not at all proprietary. Uh, this is um, about reaching a certain standard and there's no real IP. And if we could avoid someone else the pain of reinventing that wheel, we would be really happy to do so. So here is a, um, a genome, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, this is uh, some uh, a DNA molecule. It should animate and travel around, but it's not going to. So um, what will happen now is that flows through the sequ into DNA sequencing, and then we get annotated variant core files. Uh, we'll build 38 and we use dragon aligners and variant callers because we found that's efficient and we have compared them to other gold standards and found that there's very little difference and many others are adopting this system worldwide. We did use initially just gene panel filtering for tiering, so creating a variant list in rare disease or a somatic hierarchy in cancer uh, to send them back with the help of annotation companies for review in the clinic and for clinical assessment. And simultaneously, those genomes and that data go off into the research coalition because all too often it needs research endeavor to add the necessary value to make a diagnosis. And um, that is our hierarchy and pipeline. And you can see in somatic genomes, we sequence between about 82X and 100X and about 36X to 40X in germline. And this is designed to make sure you've got adequate coverage of the genome at the appropriate depth for 95% of your and my genome. These are the disorders we've worked on on the bottom. They fit a pattern of rare disease across Europe. So with the exception of hematological disorders and some of the disorders which were being worked on in another project, I think this would probably mirror because the clinicians could select the patients as providing they were likely to have a rare inherited disease that was either likely to be monogenic or oligogenic. And what we did was to reach 1,200 different disorders that comprise these system-based pillars that you see here. We standardized eligibility and phenotyping, and we used the human phenotyping ontology. And a really important infrastructure message, I think, Astrid and, and, and Serena, is let's have no apples and pears in this project. Let's just have one type of fruit choose apples or choose pears. But anchoring yourself in the human phenotyping ontology, now anchored also in SNOMED, has served us very well. And I could show you graphs that show diagnostic yield is directly proportional to the number of clinical features you record and annotate your patients with. We've automated the analytics. I've given them insights into that. But all importantly, we empowered the NHS to say where they wanted us to look. We did look genome-wide, but they also controlled closure of the cases and the relay to the families. So I'll just give you a couple of cases which I've annotated with some costs. And this is because we've got the health data so we can work out what it cost us. So the first is a four month old who, who sadly died, never left the neonatal intensive care 
uh, and had no diagnosis. Immune testing was negative. It was child was enrolled after his death because DNA had been taken by his parents, and we allowed that. And I would encourage you to do the same, because it, only if you're living with these things do you realise the in, incredible stress these families are under, and being sensitive to wanting to know for future reproductive choice what was the cause of your child's death or, or, or of your rare disease and the likelihood it will occur again. It's a big thing for families and we as health professionals need to be sensitive to that. Then his mum un unexpectedly became pregnant and said, look, I don't want to know the dying, don't tell me. And she then at month eight became anxious and said, look, could you tell me? And we found a pathogenic transcobalamin 2 mutation, which means this child couldn't take B12 inside his cells. And this explained his neurological uh, presentation has repeated infections, which are features of B12 deficiency in, in early childhood. Uh, his brother was born, and because they knew where to look, the NHS found within one week that he was sadly af affected. But he's had a totally different course, because literature uh, revealed, and we report on this in every single report we send back, that uh, there were case reports that high-dose vitamin B12 could potentially bypass the defective mechanism and uh, uh, improve the situation. So this child has had a completely different course. The first child cost the NHS in four months of ITU care 80,000 pounds sterling. I put it to you that a genome is a fraction of that, a tiny fraction of that. So when you're making arguments for should we do this and is it cost effective, I'm going to give you a number of uh, indicators that I think a genome is well worth it compared to some of the money we spend on not making a diagnosis for these people. I'm also showing you a second child because this again has been transformative for that child. This is a 10 year old who had repeated admissions to ITU and then was admitted with life threatening chickenpox, something we probably all had here or most of us. Um, but she had also a history of prior unusual infections with multiple ITU admissions and detailed immune testing had revealed nothing. She had a seven year diagnostic odyssey at a total cost of 356,000 sterling, 307 different hospital care episodes. And we found that she had a mutation in CTPS1, which is, uh, was homozygous. And it is a known pathogenic splice acceptor variant, but had not been detected for reasons we all know with exomes not reading through splice junctions. And this enabled a curative bone marrow transplant. So for her, what you now see in a health record is ITU, ITU, ITU. And then you see outpatients for monitoring of her bone marrow transplant. And she has no admissions to hospital. So we spent 356,000 of the UK's taxpayers' money on this. A genome, which is less than $600 today, that's a good deal. So um, please take this back and use it. And a bone marrow transplant was only 70,000. So you've still got change out of the 356,000 pounds we spent here. So just to show you some things that we've learned from this infrastructure. So singletons fare less well. This will be obvious to many of you than du duos or trios. There is a direct proportional increase in diagnostic yield according to increasing family members. Duos do pretty well. Um, on the right, you're seeing a chart. The blue is what we might have detected in panels and the rest is what we will find that we wouldn't have got from panels. Uh, and the ability to go genome wide is now increasingly yielding new opportunities. For example, we have automated software that looks at all of the phenotypes and looks at uh, integrating uh, animal model data called Examizer, and that has allowed us to make many diagnoses. And here are the diagnostic yields across the pilot phase. It's slightly lower in the main program, I'll show you that in a moment, but this is 25% uplift. So bear in mind these people had no diagnoses, they were being seen repeatedly in the health system. So you're getting about a 25 to 38%, depending on whether it's monogenic diseases or um, uh, across the board. And if you're looking at more complex disorders, you may be about 11, 12% where you've got an oligogenic architecture. But there are several disorders, hearing and ear, metabolic, intellectual disability, neurology, and ophthalmological that are over 25%. And there's new data even in genome, med genome medicine this week from Karolinska supporting this type of activity. So let me just share why this is so important. And this infrastructure has allowed us to accrue the information to be able to do this. So we looked at children born after 2003 that were in the pilot program. 
and they spent six years, a median of 75 months, attending 68 hospital appointments prior to a diagnosis from the project and uh, or, or from their own clinicians. That's uh, unaffected relatives, so from the same family, unaffected individuals, only 18 appointments over a longer period. Post-diagnosis, you see eight, that at 18 months, there's fewer focused clinical episodes. So we know what to do, we know what to look for, and we home in on it. So people are not moving through the clinical system on a quest for a diagnosis, seeing lots of different uh, specialists. So um, then what did it cost? So they used 183,000 episodes and um, at a cost of 87 million, that's 15,000 pounds per participant. Now this is buried in health systems because it's over several years, but look at that and think of what a genome costs. And then compared to 53,000 episodes for children who are unaffected, they still cost a lot, but not, nothing like what they, these children cost. So the message to you is that this is cost effective at shortening the diagnostic odyssey. Here's our yield from the main program. So we're at 20% at the moment, and this is after it's been validated and the clinicians have signed off on the report and told us what they did with this. About 24% of the diagnoses we send back are influencing clinical care. So they're changing diet, they're leading to vitamin supplements or opportunity to be in a clinical trial or increased surveillance or familial surveillance because there's a heritable disorder that could be in other family members. So a form of cascade screening, if you like. So this is clinical variant art. This is another piece of infrastructure that is in the NHS side and is becoming available to all researchers. So you'll be able to see this is sort of like a clock counting up the diagnosis as the researchers increase those, and that will be in the research environment. You can see the variants and you can access all that data. And very shortly, we'll bring live 78,000 families with rare disease that are phased. So you'll have phased families, which will improve line of sight on complex heterozygotes, compound heterozygote uh, etiologies. And moving to cancer, which was really, really tough. And that's because cancers are usually preserved in formalin, which is pretty toxic to nucleic acid. Here you see the range of cancers we've worked across. There are over 17,000 patients data available to you in the research environment now. When we looked at this, we had a terrible time. This is a, a formalin fixed preservation on the right, a circus plot of the genome. Lots of spurious green uh, connections and cross-linking due to formalin cross-linking. On the left, same patient, same prostate cancer, fresh tissue, and it's a much cleaner genome and you can far less spurious. So we re-engineered 400 molecular pathology pipelines, and I would urge you to look at that. I would also say for your infrastructure needs, we've got those pipelines so we can share them with you. Um, Pax gene does pretty much as well as uh, fresh tissue. So if you need to use preservative, Pax gene is a reasonable route to go. So in the cancer program, we thought when we sent reports back that potentially about half, I'm sorry, this is slightly disorganized itself in translation, uh, about half the patients in dark blue and blue might have a benefit, but I'm actually gonna show you what happened when it got back to the NHS instead. So having this end-to-end -end infrastructure in England has allowed us to see that of 3,244 patients in West Midlands, 25%, 781, had something in a report that meant that their local clinicians re-referred them to a genomic tumor advisory board. So every one of our centers have one of those, and 61% of those were deemed to have a potential action. On the right, you can see 53 people had a DPYD finding that needed to change 5-fluorouracil or capcitabin uh, dosage or uh, avoid it altogether. 21 received a licensed therapy that they wouldn't have received. 11 received an unlicensed therapy they wouldn't have received. 204 gone into a trial they wouldn't have got into. 43 are a high risk because of high tumor mutational burden of recurrence and may be prioritized towards an immunotherapy. 69 were referred to clinical genetics. And just to take you back to the central column, you'll see below the listed for GTAB box as clinically excluded. These were people who were deemed following treatment initially to have potential cure, but they have a genome that's banked and there should they need it for the future. So this is not a wasted test. And some of those will recur and need to migrate through the same system. So we've also uh, undertaken pharmacogenomics and I'm gonna just show you where we are with that. We've now enlarged our analysis to over 70,000 whole genomes and it turns out 99.5% of us 
possess a known clinical pharmacogenetics international consortium actionable gene drug pair. And across 70,000 genomes, there were a median of four gene drug pairs. This is paving the way for national panel testing in the NHS, we're just working on that at the moment, and also for potential for preemptive testing to be able to give back everybody who has a whole genome their pharmacogenomic profile against commonly used drugs in the health system. So if I was pitching this as B1MG, I would say almost everybody in this program can get benefits from pharmacogenomics in terms of preemptive knowledge. Uh, they may not ever receive the drug, but at least they knew that there was a reason perhaps not to have it or to have a reduced dose. So um, if we go to the next slide, this, oops, sorry, this slide is simply showing you the data. So the 3,500 researchers have access to 3.8 billion clinical data points from their 415 institutions in 13 countries. And they come in through a desktop. So we provide the infrastructure in which you do your research. This is increasingly the pattern for trusted research environments. And as we introduce jurisdictional legislation, which limits our ability because of say general data protection regulations to know end to end where your data is, we are going to have to federate. And that's why I'm delighted that Elixir is involved as a pan-European organization in B1MG and that we can draw upon the Global Alliance for Genomic Health Federation application programming interfaces. So Mark and I can connect our data here in England with your data in France, wherever it is in Europe, and therefore we can be running federated queries providing we can get this to work across huge resources of data and that is how we'll solve this together and these are the resources available to you now and any bona fide researcher from anywhere in any institution or hospital can apply even if you're in industry to access the resource the industry route is slightly different researchers at present get free access to the data and free compute um, we're working on a grant to avoid having to charge, but that may come at some point. But for now, it's free, and it doesn't matter where you are. You have democratically equitable access to this data. So just share with you a little bit before finishing about COVID and our new program. Uh, so we've uh, been working hard sequencing up to 20,000 severe cases and 15,000 mild or asymptomatic cases. And we also have a long COVID program. This is genotyping data published in Nature in 2020 in December on the first 2,224 cases. We're also doing the whole genomes, but they weren't ready at that time. Uh, we're just about to do our first analysis and contributing to international efforts on this. And they come from 209 ITUs across the UK. And you can see that 57 was the median age, 30% were women, 25% are from minority communities, and sadly, 22% have died. Here's the Manhattan plot from chromosome one to X, and you can see a number of loci. This chromosome three is a repeated uh, uh, validated finding. In there is a chemokine receptor two, which is a therapeutic target in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, and there may be a therapy that could be repurposed. I'll also draw your attention to tyrosine kinase two, the JAK and STAT inhibitor target, and interferon, which has not done well in trials. So this is part of the evidence, along with a trial in the US that showed that baricetinib, a tyrosine kinase two inhibitor, actually reduced length of stay in ITU that's led to the recovery trial introducing tyrosine kinase 2 inhibitors uh, like baricetinib in the study. And so these are the drugs that could be repurposed and this is what you want from this. And we're linking that to the virus as well as the human and longitudinal life course follow-up. And we're also working with the REACT study to do a long COVID program uh, with whole genomes. So in the future, the next five years for Genomics England, um, will include a major program around diversity and genomics, particularly focused on pharmacogenomics for the reasons I've said. Um, we'll also have a cancer 2.0, as we're calling it now. We'll have to invent a better name. There's been a launch. We're not involved in it, but there's been a launch of a major polygenic risk score program, which you may have seen in England in the NHS this week. We are going to focus on newborns, what we're calling today generation genome. We did a piece of work that suggests that if you look at 600 conditions that you, are, you clearly have interventions that you can use before the fifth birthday. You can focus analysis and early diagnosis to things that will be most beneficial to children. And imagine with this platform that you could usher in an era of where there's therapies, we could give those therapies early in the disease course and potentially modify this, thereby reducing disability and harm. 
So that's one in 190 live births and nine children every day in the UK. In the UK. And so that's one of the programs. And we're out to consultation with the public and patients at the moment. Um, and finally, we will continue to have rare disease involved in our program. And that's been very important. Uh, and we'll do that with the genomic medicine service. And you'll see later today how we've used all of this to affect complete transformation of the genomic medicine service, but Alex will cover that. So I'm gonna summarize now uh, for everybody. Um, I'm gonna say one thing of infrastructure that Mark has highlighted, which I didn't speak about earlier, but is very, very important. We have patients throughout this. They're in our committees, they're looking at what we're doing, they're shaping our program, they're telling us what they would like. Our experience of that with a 30 strong participant panel has been that we get a barometer of what our participants are thinking to some extent. Uh, we've learned a lot as an organization about the pressure those families are under and how we can try and help with that. And also we've learned when our participants are far less conservative in their thinking about data sharing and access to data than perhaps clinicians are. And so that has proved a fantastic platform to establish an equitable genomic medicine service that will be for 57 million people. But I'm confident with work going on in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, the same will be true there. And we hope to link up a standardized single genomic medicine consent a national genomic research library with whole genomes and eventually all data in it, de-identified where consent's been obtained for research, available to you in other words. There's an ambition for 5 million genomic tests through the um, Our Future Health or ADD consortium and early detection cohorts. But the future, and this is why I'm here, is a global coalition of intellects driving this into healthcare. We want the UK to be at the heart of that, but our measure of success is whether as being enthusiastic to be part of B1NG, we can continue to be better together and particularly in using the framework of the Global Alliance for Genomic Health. And here are the people I must thank the most, the participants in the program. Many of these people haven't yet got an answer or anything that's benefited them in cancer, but they're waiting for you to find that for them. And their trust in the program is conditional on the access to research. And here are the people who funded it. I can't name everybody because there's thousands and thousands of people involved in this. Uh, Astrid, Serena, I'd like to thank you and colleagues here from across Europe. We stand ready to help as much or as little as you wish uh, with the learnings we have, and we see nothing propriety here. This is not about individual nations. Individual nations can't solve this. It's about a coalition and medicine and healthcare without borders. Thank you very much for having me today. Mm -hmm.